Bible a book full of hope? Well, I don't know about you, but if I didn't have the hope of the Bible, I think I would be worried in today's world. And I wonder how many people out there are exactly in that position. But they look at the world around them and they wonder, well, where on earth is this world going? What on earth is going on? And, and, and how is it all going to end? Because most of the news that we ever see is, is not positive, is it? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about the negative for a little bit without wanting to scare anyone or without scaremongering as such. But I want to talk about it just because I think the Bible has an answer for just about all the problems that the world has at the moment. So you might think, well, is there any hope in this world? Is, is, how can we say that there is hope when there's so much wrong going on all the time? I mean, a world where people will throw it, um, fly airplanes into high-rise buildings to kill thousands of people or blow themselves up on a bus to, just to destroy people or where a group of people will wreak havoc in a part of the world or where there's no clean water to drink or where the financial situation is in a mess where life is just so fast paced that we're stressed out so much and what about then climate change you know, where's this world going and just recently of course I mean, we've just had it haven't we just these last couple of weeks with the incidents in London all the things going on there Where's this world going? Is there any hope for a place like this? And of course, we still, still people out there will still hope that man will sort it out. But he's not managed so far. We always have problems. And as soon as they try and sort out one problem, there's something else cropping up. And things just don't seem to quite get there, do they? So with all these things, well, where's this world going? So what I, what I did is, I, I, just because I, I like to do that kind of thing, I, I put into Google, greatest threats. And I did that just a couple of days ago. And so one of the things that came up was this one here. So this is, just, this is from the 30th of March, so this is last week. Was it Thursday? Um, and the headline there is, many young people view climate change as a bigger threat than terrorism. <coughs> So that's, that's two of the big ones there, terrorism and climate change. And he said in the same article, it said that um, majority of adults in Europe think that international terrorism is the most pressing threat. Um, but young people clearly think that climate change is a, is a big issue. Other things that were mentioned here was economic instability, they were worried about that. Poverty, they were worried about. But what, what, what struck me as well, is you can see there that the headline at the top, it's Newsweek by the way, the headline at the top, but just underneath they've got this, it's like an ad isn't it, but it's not really an ad, it's a warning. And this is about water shortage. So 783 million people do not have access to clean and safe water. Wow. And that's not going to get, that's, at the moment the way the world is going, that's not going not to get any better. It's going to get worse at this rate. So I went to the World Health Organization, the WHO, and got a bit more information on that, on that front as well. And this is, this is right, can be right depressing. So this, the news that we just saw here, the seven, 783 million people have not got access to safe drinking water. That's one in nine people worldwide. And they were saying that half of the hospital, hospital beds in the world are filled with people who suffer from diseases because of not, they haven't got clean water. That's why they're in hospital. 1.8 billion people use drinking water, which is contaminated. Oh, that's, that's a quarter, a third, almost a third of the world population. And then of course, it, because of that, lots of diseases um, are transmitted that way. And they talk about what half a million deaths each year just from that. And they're also saying that by 2025, half of the world's population will live in water-stressed areas so where water is scarce. And a little while ago, I came across this article as well, that they're saying that, so 
it's not just an environmental problem. Because in, in this article they were saying that there'll be wars fought over water. That's been done in the past, that will happen again because water is so scarce. So I, all these things, these negative things happening at the moment, and people are worried about it, obviously. A slightly different slant on things was this one here, which I, f I found interesting. It was a, from St. Lu Lucia, which is a, a little tiny island in the Caribbean, and um, an ambassador from there gave a, a talk at the UN. And you, you won't be able to read it here, probably, just about the very top bit there. I'll, I'll blow it up for you so you can see it. What's the greatest threat according to him? The greatest threat to world peace and democracy is the systemic imbalances and inequities in the global economic, sorry, global economy and the institutions that govern it. So what he's saying is there's such an imbalance in the way that things are in the economy. There's so many rich people, so many poor people. He says that's the greatest threat to peace and democracy. Because the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. This is a while ago, this was from, from the year 2000, but this is just from this year, this next one here. The Guardian, world's eight richest people have the same wealth as the poorest 50%. That's a shocking thing. Have you ever thought how, how weird, unfair, how ridiculous it seems that there's, there's eight people who own the same amount of money as the poorest half of the whole globe? That seems seen almost it seems it seems wrong and in that same article again uh, this is being said that the World Economic Forum said last week or well, this was from January that rising inequality and social polarization posed two of the biggest risks to the global economy in 2017 again you've got this inequality between the rich and the poor and, and that just doesn't seem right. So we've got, a, we've got loads and loads of different problems there. Loads of them. And if, have we got any hope when any of these things are pressing in on us? And got another one here, just a, almost a minor one, but it's possibly one that's closer to home to most of us. It's because all the stress that people are having. So there's more and more... Um, Britons lose sleep over stress at work or stress with the finances. So yeah, where are we going with this? So just put these, these threads on, on the screen there. So we've got all of these different ones, the <coughs> things that people are worried about. Wars, terror attacks, that's one of them. Next one would be issues with the environment, so pollution and all that, all the things that go with that. Where is that going to go? Is that ever going to be sorted out? And to a degree, sometimes I wonder why this one is more of an issue because we're hoping that if everybody behaved halfway decently, then we probably wouldn't have wars and terror attacks. And so people still hope that that's going to be the, hap uh, be the case. The problem with the environment is that if we carry on as we do, it's going to go down the hill. You know, that's the, that's the problem with that one. We're already doing things wrong far too much as a, as a community, as a, as a yeah, global community. We never know where the economy is going to go next. Still, are we are we're working our way up at the moment? Looks good at the moment, all right, I guess. But we've already said how unstable is it? When is the next bubble going to burst? Just don't know. I suppose poverty and hunger doesn't affect us personally, but there's plenty of people in the world which have got issues with that. And there's certainly, again, plenty of people suffer from various diseases and, and eventually loads of people die from those. And then what about the injustice in the world? People just not showing the integrity that they should. And that <coughs> seems to be a problem in the system as well. where We've got corrupt states that just don't seem to sort themselves out. And then stress, of course. That's just something that we feel. And it, to a degree, that's what we need, but is it maybe getting worse as well? I'd like to, if you've still got your Bibles there, I'd like you to come to that reading that we had in Matthew chapter 5. There's quite a few of the things in there actually answer 
some of the threats that we've been talking about. So Matthew chapter 5, this is Jesus talking. And he says then, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So there'll be a he heavenly kingdom. Something that is, yeah, you know, when we talk about something that's heavenly, it's like, oh, it's something divine, something great, something good. And that's what Jesus is saying, that some people here, they will have called a kingdom of heaven. Notice it's not a kingdom in heaven, it's a kingdom of heaven. In verse 4 then, by the way, it says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And again, there's, there's plenty of people who mourn these days. And just this morning, there was some, uh, I don't know whether you've heard the news this morning, but it's a landslide in Colombia. And there's so many people, 200 people fear dead, so many more missing. And it's again, there's, you know, all these things happening. There will be, there's plenty of people mourning, but... Here it says, they shall be comforted. Verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And there we can learn that this kingdom is actually on the earth. It's because it's talking about the same thing. Verse 6, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Right, so if you want justice, if that's what you're interested in, well then you're going to be satisfied. That's what's going to be here. So no more injustice. That's going to be there. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So people will be looked after. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So all of these things, I put them on the screen as well there. So these are the things that are promised here. The kingdom of heaven, a heavenly kingdom. People are going to be comforted. They're going to inherit the earth. So the earth's not going to be destroyed according to God's will. God, God is going to preserve it. There will, in the end, be justice for all. Mercy. It talks about seeing God and then those shall be called the sons of God. So here Jesus actually gives us just a little insight into what things will be like. And the Bible is full of passages like this, where it actually it tells us what things will be like in this kingdom of God. And that is what can give us hope. When things go wrong in the world around us, there are actually there's some hope here because there's a better time to come. As Dave said in his prayer, we're looking for a better time to come. So let's go over, have a, another, another picture from um, this time Psalm 72, if you'd like to open that. So Psalms in the middle of our Bibles. And Psalm 72. And this Psalm is what we call a messianic Psalm. It talks about the king to come. And again, it's, a, it's, a, it's been written a long time ago, about 3,000 years ago it was written. And it still talks about future time now, because this has not happened as far as we know. And it starts off there, right at the beginning, it talks about, give the king your judgments, O God. So we talked about the kingdom, Jesus talked about a kingdom, here's now the king, it talks about this king, right? So what do we know about this king? Well, let's see what, what, what he's like in verse 2. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Well, that's different, isn't it? So no more injustice here. No, this king will judge in righteousness. Verse 3, the mountains will bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. So this one is, a, is a, a different kind of king, a different ruler. He won't be corrupt like so many of today's rulers are. No, he will look after and bring justice. And who will he look after? Well, we've just seen that. He, he will look after the poor in verse 2 there. And he will 
Look after the people in verse 4 says the poor of the people then he saved the children of the needy and then he says a little bit more in verse 12 he says he will deliver the needy when he cries the poor also and him who has no helper he will spare the poor and needy and will save the souls of the needy he will redeem their life from oppression and violence and pressure shall be their blood in his sight so he will look after the people who don't usually have anyone to look after them so that different again it, different from how things are today when so many people don't seem to have anyone who look out for them they're just on their own they just need to fend for themselves now this one will be a different one we also noticed in verse 3 it talked about the mountains will bring peace to the people and in verse 7 again it says in his days the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace until the moon is no more so his reign will be one of peace and we also see from verse 8 that it is a universal one. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. So this will actually fill the whole earth. And we believe that the kingdom that's promised in the Bible is one that will fill the whole earth. And then all of these people will be looked after. And there's another verse here which I'd like to share with you. Verse 16 now I know that some of you using the AV, the King James Version, it says there'll be a handful of corn on the top of the mountain. That's a misleading translation. The New King James says there will be an abundance of grain in the tops. That's what it means. It means a handful, not just a handful. A handful sounds like a little bit. No, there'll be loads of it. There will be an abundance of food and it'll go round. So all these people who are hungry now, they will all get their share. And then what will happen is that, like it says in verse 15 there, all the people around will actually thank this king. Uh, it says, and he shall live and the gold of Sheba will be given to him. Prayer also will be made for him continually and daily he shall be praised. That's this king that's promised in the Bible. So all of these things there present us with this picture of a kingdom and a king who will actually look after people. And he'll do the right thing <coughs> for the right reasons. Another quote I'd like to share with you this time. I put it on the screen. It's from Isaiah chapter 2. And again, it, it talks about this future time. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. And we shall walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So what will happen there is that people will realize that this is the place, this is, this is the real thing, this is something worth going to. And the people around will realize, that, actually, you know what, let's go there. And he says he will teach us. And God's law will go forth from, from Zion there, it says, from Jerusalem. That will be the center of that kingdom. And then, then in the next verse it says, And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And the first part there, the, the swords into plowshares, spears into pruning, that's actually a motto which is on the UN headquarters. So they're quoting the Bible there, and none of them ever men, managed to actually get peace. The, you know the, the security council there, they're trying to get peace in the UN, and they can't. They don't manage it. Yet God says it will happen. It will happen. And this kingdom, this king that's promised and the kingdom that's promised, they will bring peace. And they will teach the nations peace and not war. They shall learn war, no war anymore. So that's what the Bible promises there in Isaiah 2. Another little thing also from Isaiah, this one here. It says, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces a feast of wine on the lees. And it's just this thing that all people will have what they need. It won't just be for the rich few. Now, God will make sure that when this kingdom comes, there'll actually be a feast for everyone who will be part of that kingdom. Right, this next one I'd like you to actually look up. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah's quite full of these kingdom passages. And again, this is when we think of all the problems in the world now, 
just see what, what this is promising us. And Isaiah was written some 2,700 years ago, thereabouts. So a long, long time ago, but again, it's already still talking about future time. And one of the problems that we saw early on was this water shortage. But look what it says here. So in verse 1 it says, The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. So there, there will be the wilderness, the wasteland, the desert will blossom. Verse 2, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. It says a bit more a little later on. Verse 6, sec second half of the verse, it says, For waters shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the deserts. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And so this, you know, you've got this picture there. You know, it's, it's actually as if climate change, it will be reversed. It's actually going to be turned back. All these places that are drying out at the moment, it's like, no, 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 we'll turn it back. In the kingdom which God has promised, there will be, again, water where it should be, and there'll be plants growing, and it'll be, it'll be great. Look what else it says, though. Verse 5, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap as, an, as a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. So all these disabilities that people have, they shall be healed. So that's the end of the NHS. And no more, no more need for it. Because it will actually be right. People will actually be healthy again. And, all. and because of that, people will jump for joy. It, it, it'd be great. And a little later on in the same chapter here, it puts it in a slightly different way. Look at verse 10. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing and everlasting joy on their heads. And again, it mentions Zion there, which is a different, different name for Jerusalem, because that's where the center of God's kingdom will be. And people will come there with everlasting joy on their heads, and they, they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. That will be a thing of the past. Oh, isn't that something to look forward to? That's something to give us hope in this world where so many things are just going wrong. But God says, no, it will be different. It will be different. Another one I want to share with you, pictures of the kingdom, Isaiah 65. So same book, just a little later on. Almost the end of Isaiah. In verse 20 it says, No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days, for the child shall die 100 years old. And what that means is that if somebody were to die at 100 years old, they would be classed as a child. So the, our life expectancy in this kingdom age is going to be extended. So people will live longer and it'll be in a happy, happy environment. And we, we, can, we can read about that a little bit from verse 21 onwards. These are the things that people will be doing. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build or another inhabit. They shall not plant and another will eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble, for they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. So this is, again, you know, it's just a setting, it's a, it's a setting of tranquility where you go about your business and it's actually okay. You know, sometimes, I don't know whether you ever think about this, but sometimes we, we've got this conversation at home where I think, wouldn't it be nice to just sort of live somewhere completely where and all you do is just actually just have a little homestead and maybe I do just plant your own vegetables and you just have a, a nice little life the good life <laughs> um, but this is in a way what it will be like 
This is what, this is what God has promised. Life will be like in his kingdom. And it also says that God is going to be very close at hand. Verse 24, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. So God's going to be, going to be right there. He's going to be listening to what they say. Not going to be far away. And then even nature will be slightly changed. Because look at verse 25. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. So that will be different again. Even the animals will be, will be at peace. That's what God has promised. A world of peace. Now, I'd like to come back to Matthew, where we started, Matthew chapter 5. Because to be part of this kingdom, we've got to try and do something. There is something involved. We've got to actually listen, not just listen to the call, but we've got to respond to it. Um, we're going to start, not just in chapter 5, we'll just go a little bit further back in Matthew chapter 4 and this is right at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus um, one of the very first says that Je uh, things that Jesus said in verse 17 it says from that time Jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand for his heavenly kingdom is near but you need to do something you need to repent so that's a part of that. So that there's this kingdom on offer. There's all these marvelous things. You've got to repent. Now to repent means to change the way you think. To have a different mindset. So it's not just, oh, I've got the, I, I'm a teacher. I've got this at school all the time. Kids will say sorry to me. If they've done something, sorry sir. But they don't really mean it because they'll do the same thing again next lesson. It's like, well, why do you say sorry? That's not a new mind. We need to change the way. Saying sorry is part of it. But we need to change the way we think. We need to have a new mind going in a different direction. That's what repent means. Jesus says we need to change the way we think. We need to stop being self-centered, being God-centered. That's what we need to be. And let's come back to that, to those, those verses we read at the beginning in, in chapter 5. Because all these wonderful things that are, that are promised there, in each of them there's a little bit of something that we need to do. Look at verse 3 again. It says... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I take the blessed, the, the, the poor in spirit here as somebody who's not proud. So, okay, if you want to have part of that kingdom of heaven, you need to be poor in spirit. Don't puff yourself up. No, you need to think low of yourself. Think of other people first. Or in verse... For it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So it's great to think that there will be comfort for those who mourn. But do we actually mourn the way that the world is going? Because if that's what we are, if we really think it's wrong what's happening out there, well, then we've got something to look forward to, and we will be comforted. Or verse 5 then, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So we need to try to be meek. And meek doesn't mean weak. Meek means that we're going to hold back. We're not going to strike out. It actually means to have your power under control. It doesn't mean having no power. <coughs> but then we shall inherit the earth. What about verse 6 then? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Well, is justice actually important to us? Because if it is... And maybe we shall be satisfied. Or what about the merciful? In the next verse, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So we need to show that mercy to other people if we want to be recipients of it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, if we want to be part of that, we need to try and have a pure heart, not fill ourselves with the wrong things. And then, of course, we could carry on, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Are we interested in peace or not? And there's one which is not mentioned here, but 
If we have faith in what it says here, if we believe it, and we repent, which means we're going to change the way we think. And the last part is that one here is baptism. We need to actually be baptized. And I'm sure most of us here probably know these quotes very well. Um, I'll put them on the screen for us. First one here, Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 38. Men and brethren, what shall we do? So these people listened to Peter who told them what they'd done wrong. And they said, well, okay, right, we understand we've done wrong. We want to change. What, what do we need to do? And Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So that's repentance. Once you believe it, repent, change the way you think, and then be baptized. And Mark chapter 16, verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So again, baptism is certainly part of it. So then, I hope what we've seen is that God has got a lot in store for us. There are a lot of positive things here. And that's why we say the Bible is a book full of hope. Because all these things that are happening in the world, all these negative things that we've been thinking about, well, in the end, God will make them right. They will be turned from the, from the bad into the good. That is what his kingdom will actually do. So we've just got to have faith that this is actually true. And I'm sure from this platform you will hear people talk about why we think the, the Bible can be relied on. So don't just take my word for it. So why can this be relied on? Because there's loads of reasons for it. That's going to be another talk though. Just want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes. Beautiful, beautiful piece, uh, beautiful verse here. I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for those who love him. So it's beyond what we can imagine what God has prepared for those who actually love him. Thanks for listening.